is the mind-muscle connection real? Well, let me answer that question physiologically and say absolutely it is. Like there's literally a connection between the mind and the muscle. And how does that work? Well, if you look at your brain, on the outer re region of the brain you have what's called a cortex. And on, the, on essentially laterally or right on the outside, you have something called the motor cortex, right? Movement is motor, okay? And coming out of the motor cortex is an actual neuron, right? Neurons are the things that send messages throughout our body from the brain to the body. So you have a, a motor neuron that comes out of the cortex, it goes down to the spinal cord, and then a neuron from the spinal cord actually goes to the muscle. And that means that your brain sends a message to the spinal cord, that sends a message to the muscle, and it contracts. So in reality, there actually is a connection between the mind and the muscle. Now, what's important to understand is that every muscle doesn't just have one connection to the brain, it has numerous connections, right? In other words, you have very small um, connections and very large connections. What do I mean by that? Well, a small connection may have a few muscle fibers, and a larger connection might have a lot of muscle fibers, okay? But the point is you have lots of these connections from the brain to the muscle. Now, why is that important? Well, a really great paper by actually one of the guys who's uh, I thought was a legend when I was coming up in, in sport nutrition and, and sport performance and still is a legend is Dr. Jose Antonio. And he actually published a paper in Journal of Strength Conditioning Research where he showed that hypertrophy, meaning muscle growth, is not uniform within a muscle. Okay, and we'll go into more detail of that in another question. But basically, if you look at the biceps, for example, right, you have the outer head and the inner head, or the lateral and medial head. If you look at the quadriceps, there's four different heads to the quads. The calves, the gastrocnemius, right, you have two heads. If you look, you can actually have more growth in the outer head than the inner head, right? Um, in all these different heads, you can have non-uniform growth. So muscle growth is not as simple as growth uniformly across the muscle. It's very important that you understand that. Um, depending on the action that you take, different compartments of a muscle will be activated. So that means that truly you do have a capability to an extent to shape a muscle, to really craft it, kind of like the Greeks did with their statues. And part of that is crafted through this mind-muscle connection. So one of the guys who's really big on this mind-muscle connection is Ben Pakulski. And if you remember from the first generation iron, Ben trained with us in our laboratory and we helped uh, prep him for his contest and uh, it was his first Mr. Olympia contest. Now Ben calls it intent, basically an intent is where you focus on the muscle and activate the main muscle first before any other muscles. We took him and we had him do normal leg extensions in the laboratory and we hooked him up with uh, electrical activity and measured the electrical activity in his muscles. And what did we find? We found that when he did leg extensions, that when he focused on the muscle, there was more activation uh, in the target muscle, the quads, than when he just lifted normally, okay? And this, the thing about this is it's not a normal study. This was a professional athlete. We took Ben and we compared him to an elite amateur bodybuilder. And we had him both do Ben over rows, right? And we found that when Ben went up in weight, the target muscles in the back kept going up in activity, but the other guy who hadn't had as much experience with the mind-muscle connection, as he actually kept lifting weights, essentially just more activity went on his lower back and his biceps. And these were relatively heavy loads, okay? So that's the first thing there is evidence for it, and there's a lot of other studies showing that there's evidence for it. Now, real great study, um, by Snyder actually showed that um, if you did use elements to enhance the focus on the muscle, you increase that mind-muscle connection. So basically Snyder showed that when you touched a muscle when someone was training it, so let's say Snyder showed that increased the activation that you would actually get, right? If you actually look, there's another study which, um, which came out recently which actually showed that um, when you use lighter intensities, okay, like say 50% of your 1RM, maybe 60% of your 1RM, and you focus on a given muscle, you have greater activation 
on that target muscle than if you didn't focus on it, okay? So what we call that is, is an internal focus, okay? So when we have an internal focus or we have an intent focus on the muscle, say I'm doing barbell curls and I focus on the biceps, I'll have greater activation in the biceps. Now what I want you to understand is in motor learning or, or even sports psychology, we talk about two different things. We say that we have, um, in essence, control over what we're doing, like normal um, cognitive control over our movements. And then we have what we call um, automatic processing. So there's cognitive processing, we're thinking about it, and then we have automatic processing, and that's where we're not thinking about it. Think about this for a second, right? Say I'm driving to work, or you're driving to work, right? And you're calling your friends, or you're listening to a podcast, and all of a sudden you find yourself at work. You almost don't even remember the ride. You weren't thinking, right? You were not thinking about that drive. It was automatic. But when you're under conditions of very high stress and you're lifting like bench pressing, it becomes automatic is what I'm saying and your body sort of takes over, okay? So underneath 60% of your 1RM, the stress is low enough to where your body allows you to think and focus on the muscle. When you're at 85, 90% of your 1RM, you have no choice. Your body will essentially shut off the more cognitive processing, okay? so. What's the point? When you're lifting lighter weights, 50, 60% of your 1RM, the mind-muscle connection really works well. On your heavy days, on the other hand, you don't get any more activation in the pecs because your mind's fully activating the pecs anyway because it's under so much stress. But it's also gonna fully activate the triceps and the delts at the same time. That's the main point. Now, what's the good thing? Let's say have some take-home messages here, right, so you can apply them. When you're lifting, with bodybuilding, it's not just all about lifting heavy, right? Because bodybuilding need to train very frequently. When you have your lighter days, mind-muscle connection is a great way to do things. Focus on that muscle group, okay? Um, as you practice, you'll get more, better and better and better, just like Ben Pakulski. Is that remember, when you're doing a movement, initiate by contracting that muscle group. So if I'm going to train chest, I should focus first by contracting the chest and then initiating the movement itself. If I'm working on the center back, I should focus on squeezing the rhomboids together or squeezing the shoulder blades together first before moving my arms, okay? The last thing I'm gonna say, so if you're just trying to do a one RM or you're basically trying to do five by five, um, that's probably not the day to do the mind-muscle connection because the stress is so high in their body that you're gonna maximally activate the pecs or the quads or whatever muscle group you're working anyway.